lecture in which I plan to talk about the proofs of the main theorems, theorem A and B and the proof of the Wilmer conjecture. Uh, so before I start with that, I would like to make some remarks because I, I think Louise asked me last time about possibly uh, controlling the genus of the mi-max minimal surface. So in general, if you, under special circumstances, you might hope to, to prove a genus estimate. For example, if your surfaces are spheres, you might hope to prove that the limiting surface is a sphere as well. But this uh, doesn't seem to be the case in our approach. So let me just mention these examples. Because remember that we work with this family of surfaces, sigma vt, where v corresponds to a, applying a conformal map to the original surface, but t corresponds to looking at the equidistant surface. So if you think, for example, uh, if you think about a curve figure eight, uh, and you look at the tubular neighborhood of radius one, for example, let's say, so the surface that you get by doing so is going to have, uh, let's see, genus two, right? So the surface tubular neighborhood of radius one has genus two. But on the other hand, if you perturb a little bit the figure eight, in order that you have, in order that you, you, you end up with an embedded curve, so something like this. Sorry. So now that now the curve is embedded, right? So the equidistant surface at distance one is still a genus two. Right? Because the picture is not going to change much if you're at a fixed distance. This you can make as small as you want. Right. So you still get this genus two surface. But on the other hand, now if I if I look at a tubular neighborhood radius epsilon, since this curve is embedded, one get a torus. Right. So this is a torus. Uh, okay. Sorry if my picture is not very nice. Right, because the curve is embedded, so now the tubular neighborhood is a, is a torus. So you get an example of a, of a surface of genus one. So this is distance epsilon, this is distance one. So you got a surface of genus one such that if you look at the equidistant surface, you got a surface of genus two. Right, so the, so the genus can actually increase. You can have any, any genus in the, orig in the original surface. You can make it even, even simpler, right? If you take a circle, the tubular neighborhood of distance one is going to be a torus. Right. But if you make the circle embedded by just separating a little bit, the equidistant surface is, distance epsilon is going to be a sphere. Right. So the conclusion is that there's, there's no way of bounding the genus of the original family. Right. So it's very important that in our theory, uh, it's, it's, it's very important that our theory works for surfaces of any genus. That's the, that's, that's the conclusion. Okay, so, uh, so remember that we are dealing with a surface inside the three sphere of genus G, embedded, closed, and smooth. And we have constructed uh, a family, we have constructed a map C, which uh, was constructed starting from the family sigma VT. So this map is defined in B4 times the minus pi pi interval. It takes values in the space of current and is continuous if we consider the topology of currents, the flat topology, for example. And this, this map ha had the property that if I look at the boundary, right, so I get the trivial surface on the top, also on the bottom, but on the boundary we get uh, geodesic spheres. So if I take V in S3, then I, I know that CVT is going to be a geodesic sphere. 
So this is going to be the boundary of some geodesic ball of radius r plus v plus t uh, centered at some q bar of v. Now, to be precise, I, I would have to use the notation of currents, right? But let me just, this is in the sense of currents. So this boundary has, has an orientation. So the radius is some number, which I wrote down explicitly uh, in the first talk, but I don't need it for this one, some number between 0 and pi. But the important thing is that I know explicitly uh, what the center map is. So Q bar gives me the center of the ball. Uh, let me call it the center map. Q bar of V is given in the following way. So remember that in our construction, this, the original family was not continuous on the boundary, so we had to do a blow-up argument. So remember that if this is a point P, right, and I and S3, let's say this is the normal direction to the surface passing through P, and I go distance epsilon in the direction of the normal direction, minus epsilon here, right? We constructed this radial map T, which collapsed uh, the complement, which collapsed the whole tubular neighborhood of radius epsilon onto the point. So we had this map T, right, which sends the complement of this guy into the into the whole thing. That's the uh, blow-up map. Uh, so then this center map is just minus T of V if V is in A star minus the tubular neighborhood. So A star was, you know, if you have a surface sigma, A star is just the component in the direction of the normal map. A is the, is the other one. It's minus T of V upstairs. It's equal to T of V downstairs. Uh, but in this region here, right, this is the region where we did the blow-up argument, we get a whole set of geodesic spheres. Right? And we can write down explicitly, uh, if I write my vector v as cosine t times p plus sine of t times the normal of p, right, where t is between minus epsilon and epsilon, uh, the center is given by minus t divided by epsilon times p minus square root of this thing here. Okay, so this is a vector of radius, radius 1. So you can see that when t equals epsilon, so we are at the interface here, you get exactly minus p, which coincides with the value of the map minus t there. And if you make t equals to minus epsilon, then you get plus p, which coincides with the value of the function downstairs. So this, fun this function is continuous. It goes from S3 to S3. So the degree argument that we need is the following theorem that this map Q bar, which goes from S3 to S3, is continuous. and has degree, this is the topological degree of the continuous map equal to the genus of the surface. Okay. So this is the only place where we are going to uh, record the information about the genus and the fact that this map has degree G. Uh, let's see, so maybe I'm going just to sketch this because I didn't do it in the first, first lecture. Let me just make a remark that you can see from this, right? So if you fix the value of V on the boundary and you look at what happens on the vertical line, so you get a whole bunch of, of geodesic spheres all centered at the same point, right? And such that the radius goes from, you know, from zero to from 0 to pi. So there's precisely one value of t such that the guy at high t is totally geodesic. It's a great sphere. 
right? Just see by the by the radius here. So there is a unique T of V, uh, which is just pi over two minus R bar V. This is a number between minus pi over two and pi over two, such that the uh, surface corresponding surface is totally geodesic. So this is the would be the boundary of the ball, radius pi over two, centered at q bar phi. So you don't what was R bar? Uh, I can give you the definition if you want, but it does. It's not going to help. R bar is, is we computed explicitly, right? So it's a it's the a number that comes in the calculation. So for example, if you look at time zero, you're not doing the parallel translation, uh, but remember that the limit could depend on the, on the angle of the convergence, so you get varying radii over there. There's an explicit formula. OK, uh, okay so, so let me just sketch the proof of this degree calculation, because this is important. Uh, the idea is that the map Q bar is piecewise smooth. So uh, if, you, if you call dV the volume form of S3, so I'm going to uh, calculate the degree by the standard uh, formula using the volume form. Right? So the degree of Q bar is going to be this number. So if you look at the integral of the integral upstairs in the region A star minus the tubular neighborhood, right? Upstairs, the map Q bar is just minus T. As I, so I get just minus T. The minus here doesn't make a difference because the antipodal map preserves orientation, right? And it's an isometry. So you can see that the map T uh, collapses. So the map T sends the region A star minus the tubular neighborhood onto the region A star. Right? So this is just the same as integrating the volume form over A star. Just because T is a different morphism between these two regions. Right? And this is the volume of A star. Right? So similarly, the integral of Q bar star dV over the region downstairs is going to be equal to the volume of A, right? So the thing is what happens in this tubular neighborhood. So then you define the following map G. So this, I'm just, it's just given by this map, right? Uh, this takes values in the tubular neighborhood. So G of PT is just cosine TP plus sine of T norm of P. So epsilon is small. This is, again, a diffeomorphism uh, onto, this uh, onto this tubular neighborhood. So the point is that now I have an explicit formula for Q bar composed with Q, sorry, with G. So if I denote by Q, Q bar composed with G, this is a map which goes from sigma across an interval onto S3. But it has precisely that expression over there. So Q of P T is just minus T divided by epsilon P minus square root of N, N of P. So we have this explicit, explicit formula. So now it's just to, we just have to compute. So we're going to need to differentiate this guy. So first we choose a base of principal directions, right? This is a positive orthonormal basis of TP of sigma, such that this is the connection of S3. This derivative is just minus Ki times Ei. 
Uh, then what I want to compute is this, right? I want to compute the integral of q bar star dv over the omega epsilon region intersected, intersected with S3. Right? Uh, but this is the same as computing because, again, g is a, you know, diffeomorphism, right? This is the same as computing the integral of q star dv on this set. And now this is an explicit calculation because uh, I just look at this volume, look at this form. If you apply q star of dv applied to a basis of this manifold, let's say e1, e2, dt, where dt is the direction corresponding to the interval. So you get the volume form on S3 of dq applied to e1, dq applied to e2, dq applied to dt. So this is the volume of S3, right? Uh, but the volume of S3 is just the volume of R4 if I put the, the normal direction here. So I can just write it like this. Uh, the volume of R4, if I put Q here, All right? So now, OK, you can differentiate explicit this with respect to E1, right? You're going to get minus T over epsilon times E1 minus the same number times K1 times E1. To assign, it's very easy to do the calculation. Uh, you also can differentiate this with respect to T. You're going to get a linear combination of P and the normal of at P. Remember that the map Q is also a linear combination of P and normal of P. So you take the product in the end, you get this expression here. Uh, epsilon K1 minus T divided by epsilon. A2, then you get minus 1 divided by the square root. Okay, this is very easy to compute. So here we're going to get the product of the principal curvatures. But remember, the Gauss equation tells me that the, the Gauss curvature is just 1 plus the product of the principal curvatures, because we are in the three sphere. So if we do the calculation, if you integrate this guy, right, this number here, we get um, well, you just have to do the calculation. So here this is a product, right? So I can write integral over sigma and integral over minus epsilon to epsilon of the expression. So I get 1 divided by epsilon square times K1 times K2. Uh, then I get minus the sum of the principal curvatures times T plus T square divided by square root of dT d sigma. Okay. So the trick now is to compute the integrals first in the variable T, then over sigma. So if you compute on the variable t, for example, if you integrate linear function t from minus epsilon to epsilon, you get zero. So this term in the middle is going to, is going to drop out. But the integral of these functions uh, times dt can be easily transformed into trigonometric integrals. You compute explicit what, what, what the integral is. It's going to be pi epsilon squared divided by 2. So in the end, you get minus pi over 2 times the integral over sigma Gauss curvature minus 1 minus pi over 2. So here there's just a constant integral of the sigma. OK, so everything reduces to the uh, Gauss-Bonnet theorem. Uh, you're going to get precisely uh, the integral of the Gauss curvature here is going to be 2 pi times the Euler characteristic, which is 2 minus 2g. 
right? And this minus one becomes a plus one, so this cancels with this other term here. Okay. Uh, so what's this? This is two. This is two. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so now we just add all the results, right? So this is, let's see, this is uh, two pi square times g minus one, I think, right? So if we add now this three integrals, right? This one, this one, and that, we get the total integral. Let's see if I can reach here. So the conclusion is that the total integral. It's just the sum, but the, but the important, you know, computation that we have to do is that we need to know the value, the volume of S3. So it turns out that the volume of, of S3 is just 2 pi square, right? So when I sum these two integrals, I get the volume of A star plus the volume of A, which gives me the volume of the whole sphere. This is 2 pi square plus this guy over here, 2 pi square g minus 1. So this gives me 2 pi square times g. But again, this is the volume of S3. OK, so this proves that the, the degree of the, of the map is equal to g. OK, this is very important because this is going to be the key element in order to rule out the possibility of the mi-max mi -max minimal surface be a, a sphere. A great sphere. If you, want, uh, if you wanted to do this not on the three sphere but on the higher dimension, you try to do something like this? Maybe you have a No, no, we haven't tried. But in, in higher dimensions, usually we talk about surfaces, so the co dimension, co -dimension is higher. The problem is there, but we, we haven't really thought about it. OK, so, so the degree of this map coincides with the genus of the surface. OK. So we have this map C, right, which is defined on the ball times an interval. But it's convenient, as I said last time, to work with maps defined on, the, on cubes, right? So we can go easily from one uh, to the other by a homeomorphism. So this is what we call the final Mimax family. So the idea is that from C, I can construct a map phi defined on the 5 cube into the space of currents with boundary 0. In the following way, I choose any homeomorphism f from the 4 cube to the ball. Uh, and in order to be precise, I just I, I can extend this function r bar any way we like. So I can assume that r bar is defined on the whole ball. Then here is the definition. We choose a function, real function gamma, which looks like this. So this function is going to be zero until time one half, and then. After that becomes linear, like this, gamma of s. Then the explicit definition is that phi of xt, this is just a reparameterization of my family. OK. So I use the homeomorphism f to go from the cube uh, to the ball. Then I reparameterize the time interval, because remember, I pointed out that there is a unique height such that you get a total geodesic sphere there. It's convenient to reparameterize the family so that it's, this height is just what, time one half. Okay. So we do it like this: two pi times two t minus one plus gamma norm of f square, the norm of f pi over two minus r bar. Uh, so the important point of this reparameterization is that, as you can see, if I compute phi at time one half, right, uh, this term vanishes since 
that, let me suppose that x is in the boundary. If x is in the boundary of the four cube, then phi of x times one half is just this guy is going to land on the three sphere, so gamma is equal to one there. So you just get c of f of x pi over two minus r bar. And this is precisely the height that makes you totally geodesic, right? So in the end, this is the boundary of the ball of radius pi over two centered at the map q bar composed with f. Okay. So here's a picture. We get the five cube now. For each point in the five cube, we have a surface. More generally, we have a current, actually, but anyway. So that in the top now, we get the trivial surface, the same on the bottom. And the sides, we get, we get geodesic spheres. But if I look at time one half now, Geodesic, the, the totally geodesic ones live there. Time one half. Okay, so we are going to work with this map. So last time I talked about the Mimax theory, right? We started from a map defined on the unit cube, and then uh, we had to explain what the discrete theory is. But anyway, this is the map that I want to work with. Okay, so what are the main properties of this map? Uh, let me just let me denote by tau. Uh, this is a subset of the space of two variables in S three. This is just the space of unoriented geodesic spheres, thought of as as variables. I remember that we, if we have an integral current, we forget the orientations, we get a varifold. Uh, so I'm going to denote this space by tau. So since I forgot the orientation, this set tau with the varifold topology is naturally homeomorphic to RP3. Right? Because if you have a totally geodesic sphere, you can just identify it with the center, which is defined up to a sign. So this is the same as RP3, essentially. Okay, so the properties of phi are, first of all, as I said, the bottom and the top are sent to zero. Uh, if I look at the restriction of phi to the sides here, Right? We get these geodesic spheres. So this map is not just continuous in, in the sense of currents, but it's also continuous in the sense of varifolds, right? here in the boundary, because these are just geodesic spheres. So this is continuous in what I called the F metric. So this means that they are continuous also in the varifold sense. Of course, the soup of the areas or the soup of the masses of these guys is bounded by the Wilmer energy of the, or the original surface. Right? That follows from the area estimate of Ross. Uh, and now my, my question now is how can I use the fact that this map has degree G in terms of something useful for the Mimax theory? The answer is that we have to interpret it in a homo homological sense. Uh, so should I write it here? Maybe I should. Let me write it there. So the information is the following. If I, if I look at the, so these are currents, right? So if I forget orientations, I denote these by absolute value. I get a varifold. And if I look at this restricted to time 1 half, boundary of I4 times 1 half. These are, uh, sorry, I made a mistake here. 
totally do that six spheres in me. Okay, so if I totally do that six sphere, you can identify with RP3 by just looking at the center. So the, these guys on time one half are total geodesic sphere, so this is sent into tau, naturally into tau. So the information that I'm going to use, it follows from this, from this theorem, is that this is a continuous map from two topological spaces. I, I can look at the uh, homomorphism induced in homology, and the conclusion is that if I do this, this is the homomorphism induced by this continuous map. It sends uh, the fundamental cycle uh, in the domain into just two times G, the fundamental cycle in RP3. Right? This is just because I'm just using here that the degree of Q bar is equal to G, and that as you go from S3 to RP3, there's a two, uh, two-fold cover. So I get two times G in the end, right? Because remember that this map is just the boundary of this ball, but if I identify it with RP3, this is identified with the center. Or maybe minus it. After I forget the orientations. So this is a map into RP3, which has degree G, right? Degree 2G, actually, if I, if I go to RP3. So in the end, we get 2G times the fundamental cycle. So the important point is that if the genus is at least one, this is going to be a non-trivial cycle in homology. Um, any questions so far? We're going, we're going a little fast, I don't know. Okay, uh, so now remember that the Mimax theory of Elmgren and Pitts is written in terms of discretized maps. So we can, uh, uh, we can, do, we can transform this setting into the setting by Elmgren and Pitts. I mentioned that in the end of my last talk. So the idea is that from this map phi, we get a sequence of maps Define in grids which become finer and finer. Right? Remember that idea, right? It's instead of a map defined on the full cube, you get maps defined on, on the vertices of a grid which approximate the original map in the flat topology. So you can think of this sequence as an element of the uh, homotopy group that I defined last, last week. Sharp means that I'm talking about the discrete theory. And this notation means that if I, as this become finer, finer, the distance between two consecutive currents in the mass norm becomes smaller and smaller. Right. Uh, and the map in the boundary respects the original map phi. I defined this last week. So out of the map phi, we can produce this sequence, and the sequence will have very similar properties. So first, I define L of the sequence to be just the soup, the soup of areas, right, in the limit. This is the replacement of the largest area in the usual Mimax sense. This is be bounded by the Wilmore energy. Uh, the finest of these maps goes to zero, right? So they become closer and closer in the mass norm. And, well, it approximates the original map in the flat topology. So the distance in the flat topology from phi i tilde to original phi goes to zero, the soup. So inside, the current is very close to the original guy in the flat topology. But on the boundary, I have a stronger property because in the boundary, I know that my map was continuous in the F metric, so continuous in very fold sense. 
So the boundary I get that they approximate also in the in the F metric. So my notation for vertices on the boundary was was this. So this means vertices, and this means that I'm talking about the boundary. Okay. So this defines me a homotope class because uh, I just look at the element represented by this sequence in this in this set. Uh, so if I look at the equivalence class of this guy. This defines me a homotope class in the sense of Elmgren and Pitts. Homotope class. So now we started from a surface in the three sphere, and we got out of it uh, a homotope class in the in the sense of in the sense of Elmgren Pitts. So the important uh, the other important property that I, that I need to mention is that. If I, if I look at a curve like this, a vertical curve, I get a non-trivial sweep out of S3. That's the final property that I need to mention. But if you take, for example, let's say this is C. So in general, C is going to be, for example, I can put one third, one third. And the last coordinate that put zero. So if I define uh, VI to be, so this is a one dimensional family. I'm talking about the same grid, but I'm just looking at the vertical path here. So the definition is VI of X is just VI over the vertical path. C plus X times E5. This gives me a, a, a one-dimensional uh, family, right? Going from zero to zero. And the point is that this is a non-trivial family. So if I look at the homotope class of this guy, this is non-trivial in this discrete guy. The reason uh, one can, the reason for this is that be, remember that uh, this one parameter family of, of currents is homotopic to the one on the boundary, right? I can just move it homotopically here. But the one on the boundary is just geodesic spheres going from a, a south pole to a north pole, right? So this is a, a non trivial, non trivial homotopically. Okay. So this is the preparation. The theorem that I want to prove, this is key in the construction, is that if the genus of the surface is at least one, then the number that you get by doing mi max theory to this family is strictly bigger than 4 pi. Right. So in other words, if you, do the, if you apply Mimax theory to this family, you're going to get a minimal surface. This minimal surface cannot be a great sphere because its area is going to be given by this. Right. If you, do it for, if you start with a sphere, of course, this could be 4 pi, right? OK, so let me talk about the proof of this. Is, is this clear? So this is the key. That's the third um, main idea, right? So the first main idea is to do the blow-up argument. The second one is the degree argument. The third one is to find a way of proving, of ruling out. So we are ruling out great spheres. That's the goal of that. So the, the idea is to prove by contradiction. So let's suppose this number. Oh, yeah, you can have that. But then it's even better, right? The area goes to 8 pi, and yeah. <laughs> 
So to be precise, I'm ruling out great spheres with multiplicity one. <laughs> okay, so suppose this number is four pi by contradiction, right? So, so the idea is the following. So as I said uh, last time, right? So in Emacs theory, you can always choose an optimal sequence. That's called the critical sequence. So we can choose a critical sequence here. S. By optimal, I mean, by optimal, I mean that the, air, the soup of the areas of the surfaces here is, as i goes to infinity, goes to full pi. The precise value of the, the precise mean max invariant. Okay, so I get this guy. Uh, so we know that if I look at any, any guy in the critical set, these are just the limits of surfaces with areas converged to full pi in, in very fold sense. So any guy here has to be stationary. Okay. But stationary in this particular case with area four pi, so any guy, uh, any minimal surface that can come out of this has to be a great sphere because the area is four pi. C of S is the critical set. No, the idea is that you look at the, you have a map in the grid, you look at the surfaces with, with, which, with, with largest area and consider the limits of the surfaces. Right? In the usual theory, this would correspond to picking a surface that has largest area. So these guys would be the variables in the limit which have area equal to the, to the width. So that was the definition of this critical set. Anyway, so, okay, so this is just, so the, the point is that if a sequence of variables here if the areas go to full pi, they must converge to a great sphere. So I'm going to run a homology argument. So let me just introduce some notation. So if X is a topological space, I can talk about the homology of X. And for this argument, it's convenient to work with cubical homology. Instead of simplexes, we use cubes. Uh, we can do the same homology theory using cubes. So C n of x is just the group of cubical singular chains. In x with integer coefficients. Uh, of course, if we have a map from continuous map from two topological spaces, uh, this induces a homomorphism in the space of chains just by composing the chain that you had on X with F. And also this passes to a map in the homology level. Right? So these are the notations, the usual notations for these homomorphisms. And the point here is that we're talking about a grid. So if I, if I, have, uh, if I have any cell in the, in the grid, I can think of this cell as a, as a, as a cubical chain itself, right? in, in the five cube. So if I have uh, alpha, uh, let me just make sure I got it right. So here should be five, right? This is a five cube. <laughs> so if you, if you pick any P cell, P could be any integer number, you can think of this cell as a map from the P cube to I5, right? In a, in a canonical way. So this is a, so if you want, one can think of a cell also as an element, as a P chain in I5. So in general, we're going to consider chains which are linear combinations of cells. With integer coefficients. 
So these are chains in the cube. OK, so let me do the argument. Maybe I should uh, avoid uh, you know, using too much notation and then explain. Sorry? Alpha? Alpha is a sequence. No, it's just freezing k. You know, you have a grid. So you fixed grid k i. Fixed grid k i. Any cell can be thought of a chain, right? Okay. Okay, so, uh, right, so let me, so let me maybe explain this with, with some pictures. So first of all, you choose some number very small. This guy is to be chosen later. Okay, so I will explain exactly uh, where I will use the fact that epsilon naught is small. Uh, so before I start doing pictures here, let me just do some observations. First, uh, once I fix this guy, I can find a delta such that uh, Remember that we have a map defined in the five cube. So here's time one half. So if I look at, let's say I denote by J delta, the set, you know, this tubular neighborhood around, around time one half in that, I get that any point in J delta so let me, if, if I take x in j delta, which is just boundary of I4 times 1 half minus delta, 1 half plus delta. Remember that the map is continuous in very fold sense on the boundary. So I get that the f metric of phi of x. This is important just so that we don't get confused with the, with the constants. So if I pick a point x here, I can compare the varifold here with the varifold at time one half, very close to each other. Uh, these guys are very close, right? Just because it's continuous in the boundary, I can choose delta so that any surface here is close to the surface at time one half. Uh, then we can, even, we can choose an even smaller epsilon so that the opposite happens. If, you ha if I have a point on the boundary such that I know that my surface is close to be a total geodesic sphere, so the distance to the set of total geodesic spheres is less than epsilon 1, then I know that this point must be in this strip. This is just because the total geodesic spheres are precisely those at time one half. So if you are close to a total geodesic sphere, you must be close to time one half. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Let's see. <clears throat> so here's the argument. So we're going to work with a very fine grid. Right, so let me draw a picture here. This is, doesn't look very fine, but anyway, just to, for simplicity, right? Uh, I5 Ki, and for each point in the grid, we have a, a surface. So in, the, in my general talk, the talk that I gave before this series of three lectures, I gave a sketch of this argument talking about submanifolds. They are not really submanifolds. So, so now I'm going to explain the real argument that uses cubical chains. Okay. So the idea is the following. Uh, I know that here I get the trivial surface in the bottom, right? Trivial surface here in the top. So I look at all my my idea is the following, right? So I look at all cells. I define the following set. Take all five cells. For example, this. Look at all cells, such that no point of the cell is close to a total geodesic sphere. 
So look at all cells such that everything is far from being totally geodesic. So the set of cells such that the F metric at a point to the set of total geodesic spheres is at least epsilon 1 divided by 2 for any vertex in the cell. Right? Uh, this is my set A bar of I. So I'm going to think of the yellow, let's say the yellow cells over there. Now I take A of I. Uh, so the first observation is that if I look at the bottom, right, since this guy is just next to a trivial surface, the area of this surface is very, very small. So this set contains all the cells in the bottom. Right? So everything here is contained in A of I. So I can denote by A of I the connected component of the set A bar of I that contains the bottom. So this means I want, I'm going to look at all cells such that I can find a path horizontal vertical which connects this cell to the to the boundary right so this is going to be my my set ai maybe there's an isolated cell here with this property right but i don't take this one i just take those that can be connected to the bottom okay then i look at the set b of i which is just the set of all four cells that are faces of exactly one cell in A of I. This is a kind of combinatorial right, argument here. You know, as we take the boundary of this guy, right, you get some cells that are contained in the, in the boundary. We get some full cells that are contained in the interior. But those cells can be divided into the ones that are faces of one, five cell or those that are faces of two five cells, right? In your picture, you're drawing cells in the middle of the boundary that are colored. That means they're close to, they're far away from the geodesic sphere, but the middle is the geodesic sphere on the boundary. Oh, in this picture, does it, you know, it's not supposed to be... Side, on the right side, I see, I see yeah. four cells colored. Okay, so maybe you should erase this cell, right. something like that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Far away from the one column. I have to be far away from one half, yeah. Yeah. OK, so, so B of phi is just a set of four cells that are cells of precisely one five cell. Right. Then I can define the following chains. I, I don't want to erase this. Is this tau or RP3 if you want? So then you define the following chains. You, you define A, capital A of I, to be just the sum of all cells in A of I. So this is the yellow chain there. Sum of all alphas in A of I. So this is naturally a five chain in I5. Right? And if I take the boundary of this guy in the sense of in the sense of chains, right, I get exactly the four cells that are in B of phi, right? Because if a full cell is a face of two five cells in the set, they cancel each other and this cell doesn't appear in the boundary. So the boundary of A of phi as a chain is just the sum, maybe with some sign of the cells in B of phi. Okay. And as I said uh, in the beginning, uh, all, four, all cells in the bottom belong to the yellow set. So in particular, the, the faces, the, you know, the corresponding four faces, this orange thing here, they belong to B of phi, right? Because they are faces of precisely one five cell in A of phi. So if I look at uh, 
beta. This is the four dimensional cube. If I look at the four cell and the four dimensional cube and take the product with zero, this means a full cell in the bottom, this belongs to B of I. And finally, I define uh, C of I to be the four cells that appear in the boundary. But I want to collect the cells that are contained either in the top or in the sides. Contained in top or sides. Okay? So the idea is that when I compute the boundary of this yellow region, I'm going to have uh, cells which are in the bottom. This is, this is given here, right? I'm going to have some cells in the interior, which I've, I, have, I haven't collected yet. And I'm going to have some cells which appear in the sides and in the top. Those are the cells that I put in, in CO5. But they're far away from 1,000. So what, how can you reach the top? You could reach, yeah, let me, that, that's the point. I want, I want to prove that I cannot reach the top, but I need an argument. So a priori could have something like this. But one half is here. One half is here, right? So in the top, I get the trivial surface. Right? So one half is some. I mean, my picture. Yeah, this is supposed to be a high-dimensional picture, right? Okay. So a priori, I could have a cell in the top, in the right top, so that I can find a path going to the bottom. I want to prove that this is not possible. That's the next step. OK, so here's the key, the key chain that we work with. I have to control the time here. So we define R of i to be the boundary of A of i minus I take off uh, everything that is in the boundary of the cube. I take off all these guys such that alpha uh, is in the boundary of the cube. OK, so I look at all only faces in the interior of the 5 cube. That's my R of i. So R of i would be in this picture. Let's see. Oops. Maybe we should use a different color. So R of I would be something like this, right? Right, something like this. <coughs> right? I look at the boundary and I only look at the cells that are in the interior. That's R of phi. Maybe zero. Maybe zero, yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to prove that it's not, zero. it's not zero because it has to separate. OK, so, uh, so the important property of R of i is that every point in this red set here is actually close to a great sphere, right? Because this is precisely one cell. So if I look at a, if I look at a red guy in R of i, what I know is that this is the face of precisely one cell in A of i. But this means that the other cell, because this is in the interior, the other cell is not in A of i, right? Uh, those are the faces. The interior faces that are contained at the boundary of the yellow region. So I look at the so it's a, it's a boundary of the yellow region. It's a four dimensional. Yeah, piece. that's a four chain. Yeah. Four chain. Yeah. This is a four chain. I five. So I take the boundary and I take off the, the cells that are contained in the boundary of the cube. Right. Only look at the interior faces. So if I pick one guy like this in RFI, I know that this is a face of precisely one 
cell in the yellow region, right? Here. But since this is in the interior, I know that there's another cell, right? So this other cell cannot be in A of I. Otherwise, it would cancel out, yeah. Otherwise, it would cancel out. So since this guy is not in A of phi, what I know, right, this, of course, it would be in the connected component if it were in A bar of I. So it's not even in A bar of I. So what I know is that there must be one vertex in the cell upstairs, which is close to a ge total geodesic sphere. So there must be one guy here that has distance to tau uh, smaller than epsilon 1 over 2, right? But remember that this grid is very fine. They're, the consecutive currents are closed in the mass norm, right? So this means that everybody here in the red guy is close to tau, because it's just one cell. Yeah? They're very close to each other. So the conclusion is that for every point, Yeah, you take i sufficiently large okay. so that the finest becomes smaller than epsilon naught. So you can go from this point to any point in the red guy by at most a constant which depends on five, like, because this is a five cube, right? You could maybe, maybe you need more than two, but it's bounded by the number of parameters. So for every point x in R of i of zero, I know that uh, the f metric of the corresponding surface, this is very close to being totally geodesic. Okay? So everybody now in the red guy is almost a sphere in very full sense. Okay, and the crucial lemma now is to prove that this picture is not right. So I want to prove that I cannot go up to the, to the top so I want to prove that if i is very large, if i is sufficiently large, then if I look at a cell in the top, so it's something like this, right, is not in A of i. Right? So I'm what I'm saying is that this guy cannot be here. Right. So let me explain why. This is the place where, you know, we're going to use the one-dimensional parameter family. So suppose, it do, suppose this doesn't happen, right? So then you have your grid. So if I can, if, if this doesn't happen, it means that for a subsequence of grids, I can find a horizontal vertical path going from the top to the bottom, right? Contained in A of I, right? Maybe I should, I should use the picture there. Hmm? Sorry. <laughs> right? So if this picture was like before, I would be able to find, uh, let's see, a path like this. Right? Not necessarily in Ri. No, not necessarily in Ri, but in A of I. So I get a path, let's say, uh, gamma i contained in A of i, right? Like this, and going from the top to the bottom. But in this case, I look at now at the surfaces over along this path, right? This gives me a one-parameter family of surfaces uh, on S3, uh, right? So this is a non-trivial, non-trivial path, but because this guy is inside the yellow region, right? I know that the distance of any surface on the blue guy to, to the set tau is at least epsilon 1 over 2. So I got a contradiction because min max theory would tell me that along this one parameter family, 
there must be a sequence of uh, surfaces converging to a great sphere. Right. So maybe I should uh, speed up a little bit. But the idea is that if you take the sequence phi i composed with gamma i, call it d. So this is a non-trivial homotop class in pi 1. Right? This is a non-trivial guy. So in the end, you, apply, you, you can apply MIMAX theory to this one parameter family. Right. And the MIMAX theory will tell you that, you know, will tell you that there is a minimal surface. There is a, a priori MIMAX theory. This could be a, a bunch of minimal surfaces with integer multiplicities. But this is not going to be the case here because the area is 4 pi. But a priori could be like this, uh, such that each guy is uh, smooth and minimal, such that the area of this guy is equal to, if I denote by omega the homotopy class of this sequence, uh, MIMAX theory tells me that the width of this homotopy class is achieved by a minimal surface, right? But of course, this guy is going to be, at most, the soup of the areas over D. And the soup of the areas over D is, at most, the soup of areas of my original guy, my five-dimensional guy, which are called S. And I'm assuming that the original guy was optimal. And by contradiction, I was assuming that this area is 4 pi. So on the other hand, because this is a minimal surface, right, this area has to be at least 4 pi. So this tells me that sigma is a great sphere. And MIMAX theory also tells me that I can, I can obtain this guy by taking a limit of surfaces here. In very full sense. OK, this is a contradiction because sigma is in tau. But the, the path is in the yellow region, right? So I know that the f metric of any point here to tau is at least epsilon 1 over 2. So this gives me a contradiction. So what I proved is that this picture is not right. I cannot go up to the, to the top. Right. Because it has area 4 pi. So this is the only minimal surface of area 4 pi in S3 is, uh, is the great sphere. OK. so. So now that I know that this guy doesn't sep sorry, that this guy separates, so this picture was wrong. This is the correct picture. I know that R, the region R of I does not touch the top. Right. Uh, let's see. Maybe I should erase this. So in order to finish the argument, the idea is that, OK, so I proved that this region separates the top from the bottom. So this means that when I look at the full cells contained in top or sides, I don't have anything in the top. I only have cells in the sides. So C of I is contained in the sides, right? So I can define uh, C of phi to be just the sum of these cells. So the important point now is that this C of phi is a chain 
on the sides of the cube. That's the point, right? The CO5 is the same in the sides. So if I compute the boundary of my guy, R of I, I get that the boundary of R of I is equal to, well, the boundary of the boundary is zero, so I get the, the boundary of that guy over there, right? When I look at the cells in, in B of I. So the idea is that I only have to look at the cells in the bottom and the cells on the sides. So I get the boundary of the cells in the bottom. Uh, minus the boundary of the, the cells on the sides. That's what I get. But now notice that this is going to be a three chain on the sides, right? Because this is in the bottom, right? This is in the sides. And the important point is now that, is that as I say, the chain C of I is contained in the boundary of I4 cross I. So if you look at this formula in homology, this is telling me that this is telling me that the boundary of R of I uh, is homologous to the boundary of I four cross zero in boundary I four cross I. Right. So the boundary of the this guy here is homologous to the one homologous to the bottom, but then it's also homologous to the time one half, the time one half guy. So this is the same as taking the boundary times one half. And since I know that the surfaces here are close to great spheres, I can do the uh, homology here in J delta if you want. So now, the, in order to prove the contradiction argument, what I do is the following. So the idea is to contradict this, right? And use the fact that I have extended the things to the interior. So we look at the following map, phi hat. So this is a map defined on the boundary of I4 cross I into tau. The final homology has to happen into tau. Right, so I need maps that take value in tau. So the definition is I take some point xt here, and I send to the surface at x one half. Right, this is the this is the definition. So the claim. This is the final argument for this proof. Here, is that there, that I can extend this map to the boundary of RFI that there is a continuous extension Fi defined in the red region, so the support of R of I into tau. There's a continuous map with Fi restricted to the boundary. It's just this map phi hat. So I'm not going to give any details, just tell you the idea. The idea is that in the red region, our surfaces are not exactly great spheres, right? but they're close to being a great sphere. They're very close. So I raised here, but the distance of any surface in the red guy to tau is very small. So the point is that if I, if I draw my picture, no. If I have the boundary of R of I like this, Sorry, this picture is not very good. Right. For each point, for each point here, x i, I know that phi i of x i is very close to tau, right? So I can choose a point in tau that achieves the distance. Let's say y. Y is in tau. 
So now I, I, I replace my original surface by, by this point Y. And here the boundary, I do the same thing, but I replace by phi hat. Just because, you know, phi, if I, if I pick xi in the boundary, this is sort of like a projection argument, right? So phi i of xi in the boundary, this is very close to the original map phi in f metric. But now everything in the boundary happens at the distance j delta that I wrote here. So I can replace the surface here by the, a surface at time 1 half with very small distance. So this guy is very close to uh, phi i hat at the same point. So now I, I replace my original surface by this guy. So in the end, what I'm doing is define first the map fi on the vertices. Right? So I define the map like the following thing. So fi of, of a point is going to be, well, it's going to be this guy if the point is in the interior. And it's going to be this guy if the point is in the boundary. I'm just replacing by great spheres in very small distance. But the conclusion is now that I have a map defined on the vertices of this complex such that the distance between the surfaces in two consecutive vertices is very, very small. Right. Taking value into, the, into a manifold, right? Tau is just RP3. So if this distance is very, very small, these guys fall into convex neighborhoods, so that I can just extend the whole thing to the complex. So now is the idea is that you choose epsilon, not the original guy. I said it would be chosen later, right? You choose this guy very, very small, so that you guarantee that in the end, the distance of two consecutive guys is going to fall into a very small convex neighborhood of RP3. And then by standard argument topology, you extend first to the one skeleton, then to the two skeleton. You extend Fi to the whole thing. And this gives a, a contradiction because This gives a contradiction because if I look at phi hat star at the boundary, remember the definition, right? Phi hat star is just this given by this guy. But phi hat was extended to fi, so this is just the same as fi star at the boundary. I can do that because both fi and phi hat take values in tau, right? So now this is, of course, this is the same as taking the boundary of fi sharp of r phi, right? But this is the same as saying that the, the original guy was a boundary. Right? So this is zero in homology. But I can compute the same guy in a different way. using the fact that the boundary of R of I is homologous to the time one-half cycle. Where is it? Here, right? It's homologous to the time one-half cycle. So the same thing can be computed by phi hat star of the time one-half cycle. But at time one-half, phi hat is just my original, my original phi, right? my original fee. And this, I, I, I computed this was 2G. All right. It's 2G. Right? So, so if the genus is 
bounded by one, we get a contradiction. Therefore, we prove that the Mimax invariant cannot be full pi. This was the argument. Any questions? Because we need to finish. So now it's going to be fast. We need to finish the main theorems. Is it clear? No problem with the fact that yi is not unique, and you might actually equal m sub 1 over 2. Yeah, so the main no, I mean, it doesn't need to be unique, right? We just need one extension, right? The only important point is that very close. They are very, very close. And, and when you get equality, no, there's no problem because remember this is a very small small number that I can choose very very small. Right? So the quality here is not a problem here. You know I can choose epsilon one to be very small from the beginning. The only point is that uh, they have to fall in convex neighborhoods so that when I extend to the one skeleton, this thing is still inside some convex ball. Right. When I go to the two skeletons, still inside of this in the in a convex ball. But I only have to do it finitely many times because it's a five dimensional parameter. So I can guarantee that everything stays in a convex ball, and I can do extensions. I don't need a natural extension. I just need the fact that there exists one. Yeah, so in the end, this number depends on the geometry of the projective space, right? So there is no small number so that the balls are sufficiently convex in RP3. OK, so uh, in 10, 10 minutes, I, I would like to just finish the proofs of the main theorems. Sorry about the time, but we, we're just at the very end. So after the epsilon 0, it doesn't depend on anything. Yeah, it's a universal. It doesn't need to be that small, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so let me just sketch uh, how to use this to prove the main theorems. I'm going to do this very quickly. So the, we want to prove first theorem B. Right? So we want to prove that if sigma inside S3 is an embedded closed minimal surface, mean cover to 0. Uh, and if the genus is at least 1, so I said that it's very important to, to prove something general for any surface of any genus, then we prove that the area of sigma is at least 2 pi squared. Well, inequality holds if and only if sigma is the Clifford torus. So the idea to prove this, to prove this is the following. So we're going to use uh, Urbano's result, right? So we're going to use the following theorem of Urbano which is a characterization of the Clifford torus by the index. But the important thing, again, is that it doesn't assume anything of the genus. Right? So you have a minimal surface of S3, a genus, any genus that you want. If the index of sigma is at most 5, then sigma is either the Clifford torus, which has index 5, or a great sphere which has index 1. OK, so in general, uh, when one does Bmax theory, one should expect that if you work with a family of five parameters, the index of the critical point should have index at most 5. That's what you expect. But this is not known, uh, this is not known in general. So we need an indirect argument here. The idea is that you look at the space of all minimal surfaces. You look at all minimal surfaces embedded in 
of genus greater than or equal to one, right? So genus one, we know that it's only the Clifford Torres, of course, by result of Brandle. But I, I, I take the collection of all minimal surfaces of genus greater than or equal to one. Then one can prove by standard arguments in geometric measure theory that there is one surface there. When I prove that this guy is the Clifford Torres, but there's one guy there which has minimal area. Okay. So when you know we can prove we do this in the appendix just using standard arguments in geometric measure theory. Another way of doing it is using a result of Kuvert Lee and Schatz. So they, they they proved that if you look at the minimal Wilmot energy of any surface of genus G, uh, they proved that these numbers converge to eight pi as G goes to infinity. Right, so of course the remote energy of a minimal surface is the, is the, is the area. So this, this is saying that if I want to minimize the area among these guys, I don't need to go, I don't need to go to genus up to infinity, right? So you can work with bounded genus, and it's known that the space of minimal surfaces with the genus bound is compact by the work of Choi Shen. So you can just, there's another way of doing it. So the claim is that we don't know the genus of this guy because a priori there could be a higher genus surface with smaller area. But the claim is that the index of this guy is at most five. And the, the idea is just to suppose that it's not and to perturb the family. So the idea is that suppose it's not. Suppose the index is at least six. Then we had this original family, right? We had this family uh, sigma vt defined for v in the ball and t for minus pi pi. So v equal to zero, we have our surface, minimal surface here. So this is a five-dimensional guy, right? So what I claim is that if, the, if I have an extra, this is five-dimensional, right? If I have an extra direction that decreases area, I can perturb my family here so that the area goes down, right? So I can produce, I had this original family which I called CVT, but if I have an extra direction, I can produce a C prime uh, VT, which is just a perturbation. Uh, such that the area goes down inside here. So I don't have time to discuss, but basically the perturbation the perturbation here is enough. So once you prove that the area goes down here, uh, the area cannot be the area of sigma outside. So we produce a family that one can prove that the soup of the masses of this guy. You have to prove this, but anyway, this is trickle less than the area of sigma. Using this condition, right? Then one does Mimax theory. Uh, to this family. So one does, now I work with C prime instead of C. So I have C prime. As before, I can define some phi prime out of that. So I get a homotope class pi prime divide, uh, defined the same way. So because the genus is at least one, the same way we get that the width of this guy cannot be 4 pi, right? Because you only use boundary properties, right? The deformation just takes place here. So the same arguments work for this perturbed family. So Mimax theory tells us that there exists a minimal surface, sigma prime, minimal. Uh, smooth, embedded, such that the area of this guy achieves this number. That's the content of Mimax theory. But now this number is going to be strictly less, right? 
in the area of sigma because I'm working with the perturbed family. Remember that the area of sigma is, is always bounded by the area of the Clifford torus, of course, which is less than 8 pi. So this way we guarantee that this has multiplicity 1. So I know that the area of sigma prize is strictly bigger than 4 pi, right? So because of this guy, right? Because of this inequality here, I conclude that sigma prime cannot be a great sphere. So in the end, I conclude that the genus of sigma prime is at least one, but this is a contradiction. Since I get that the area of sigma prime is strictly less than the area of sigma. And sigma was chosen to be the one with least area. This is a contradiction. This means that the index is five, right? The index is at, is less than or equal to five, and then it has to be the Clifford torus, right? Because it has genus bounded by one. So sigma is the Clifford torus. So in other words, I proved that the surface, minimal surface with least area in this class of any genus is the Clifford torus. So this proves me the, the bound, and one can prove rigidity as well. So because of time, I maybe just should mention how to prove the, the final theorem. So in the end, we want, we want this to want, use this to prove the Wilmer conjecture. Uh, so that's the content of theorem B. Uh, so it's clear that one gets rigidity as well, right? Because I proved that the, you know, if you if you get something with equality here, again the index has to be five because if it was six, I could perturb and make it smaller. So one gets rigidity as well. So finally, theorem sorry, not theorem B, theorem A says that if you have any closed surface embedded genus G greater than or equal to one, then the Wilmore energy of sigma is bounded by two pi square and equality holds if and only if sigma is the Clifford torus. up to conformal transformations of S3. So we also get rigidity. Well, the proof now, now becomes short because one just has to do Mimax theory to this guy. So remember, we have a surface sigma, so we have the family of Ross. So out of that, we get the Mimax family. So we get a homotopy class. And now since the genus is at least one, we know that the width cannot be four pi. So I apply Mimax theory to this homotope class, and I get a minimal surface, sigma prime, minimal, with the property that the area of sigma prime achieves the width but of course, I proved that this number is not four pi. On the other hand, this number is less than or equal to the soup of the areas of the original family. The areas of those guys were bounded by the Wilmore energy of sigma, right? And because the area of sigma prime, this is a minimal surface, cannot be four pi, I get that, again, that the genus of sigma prime is greater than or equal to one. Again, if it's multiplicity 2, it's even better, right? You get, you get 8 pi. So by the theorem B, now this is a minimal surface which lies in the class F1. We know that the area of sigma prime is at least 2 pi square. And now, so I, I just proved that this was a bound for the Wilmer energy. Right? So in order to get rigidity, the, just the final, the last line here, the idea is that if you have equality here, right? 
So we do mimax to this, fam to th to this family of sigma vt. So if you have equality here, this must be that the area of at least one of those surfaces is 2 pi square. Because otherwise, again, I could make it smaller and run into a contradiction. So in the end, what we prove is that, and if, you, if one looks at the area of these guys, this has to happen at time zero, right? Because the original estimate of Ross was that this area of, is bounded by the Wilmer energy of sigma. There was a correction term here, something like this. So if t is not zero, it goes down. So the area has to be achieved at time zero. So it means that there is a v in B4 such that the area of sigma v is exactly equal to 2 pi square. But remember that 2 pi square is the Wilmer energy of sigma by assumption. And the Wilmer energy is conformal invariant. So this is equal to the Wilmer energy of sigma v. But by definition, this is the integral of 1 plus mean curvature of v square. So in order for this guy to be equal to the area of sigma v, the mean curvature has to be 0. Right. So one proves that this guy has to be mi minimal, which means that sigma v is the Clifford torus. So I proved that some conformal map sends my original surface to the to the cliff torus. Okay, that's it. That's enough. I should end here. Thanks.